It's question show time. Your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are on my channel, if a question pops into your brain, just write it down, gather them up, and I will answer them here. I apologize for the birds. There is a big crowd of uh, pine siskins uh, up in a tree right above me. All right, stick around. Another guest question. All right, let's get into it. Tobias Sonnewald. Hi, Fraser. It would be interesting to hear your thoughts regarding the new space race to the moon, especially SpaceX versus NASA. What will happen to SLS NASA if Starship makes it first? Yeah, we are definitely in a different time than what happened back in the Apollo era. And I think the big difference that we're seeing this time around is that we've got choices, right? There's a bunch of people all at the same time racing to land humans on the moon. Obviously, you've got NASA with their Artemis mission, hopefully by 2024. You've got SpaceX working on their Starship. They think they can do it by 2022. Who knows what the Chinese are up to? The Russians have said they can do it. Um, Lockheed Martin and Blue Origin and Northrop Grumman are coming together to build a landing system. You've got potential even private combinations between I think Northrop Grumman and Bigelow Aerospace. Um, so there's like five, the European Space Agency is planning their own lunar village, six. Anyway, you've got all of these different options for being able to send humans to the moon this time around. And so that's completely different than the Americans versus the Soviet Union back in the 1960s and 70s. And how this is going to play out is going to feel very different, I think. And right now, of course, NASA is building the Space Launch System. They were originally going to be building their own lunar landing system, but now it looks like we're going to bring in some kind of a commercial provider. In fact, we've got a whole episode um, coming that's going to explain sort of all the different lunar landing options. And, and this plan is either, you know, again, there's lots of options. They might use one launch of the space launch system in its heaviest configuration, which the White House is trying to cancel, um, that could carry everything to the surface of the moon. Or it might be that they use a whole bunch of Falcon heavies and then one final space launch system carrying the Orion uh, capsule with the astronauts. So everything is kind of in flux. And I think that's how you're going to see this all play out, is that if Starship does fly soon, proves that it can go orbital, goes to the moon, demonstrates that it can land on the moon and return safely back to Earth, then I think you would see Space Launch System just get cancelled, right? Like, it's ridiculous to keep building that spaceship when, uh, that rocket system, when there's a reusable rocket that could do it for a fraction of the price. Like, it just doesn't make sense. But it also doesn't make sense to cancel it yet, because... That's how we got into this problem in the first place, was that we waited for one provider, NASA, to make all of our space exploration wishes come true. And, and that's never a good idea. Competition is a good thing. It's better. And this is why, I mean, like of all of the things that I'm so grateful for, for Elon Musk to enter this field, is to just reinvigorate the whole process, to change everybody's thinking about what's possible. And it is going to be this time in the next couple of years where we're going to see lots of new ideas, lots of new rocket systems, many different ways that people are going to attempt this. So how do I think, like if I, and you know, we'll know in four years of how this is going to play out. Here's how I think this is going to play out and we'll see what happens, right? Which is that I think that the Starship development is going to take longer than planned. I don't think it's going to make it to the moon by 2022. I don't have any reason, only that it's new technology, new things take longer, you have to work out the kinks. I think that it's going to be tight for NASA to be able to reach the moon by 2024. Same thing, I think that's going to slip a little bit. But I do think by 2028, you're going to see a lot of technology converging on being ready to make these lunar missions, definitely by the end of the decade. So I think we will see humans set foot on the moon before the end of the decade. And I would not be surprised, really, by any of those combinations. I would not be surprised if Starship makes the flight. I would not be surprised if it ends up being the Artemis mission through NASA, but supported by various SpaceX and even uh, Blue Origin hardware. And I would not be surprised if the Chinese are the first ones to do it as well. So uh, it's still kind of anyone's race, and I'm excited to see how it all plays out. But I love the fact 
that there are at least three more uh, different teams working to complete this feat, which means that this time, hopefully, we'll stay. Rui PTG, I don't understand why men of science who say what you just said. If there is no evidence so far, then my default position has to be that they don't exist. That's only the logical train of thought to follow with regards to, for example, supernatural claims since they are beyond what is naturally possible. But alien life is possible since it's just life, like us, which is more of your evidence right there. How can an alien civilization prove to themselves that we exist if they are possibly on the other side of the galaxy? They probably would struggle just as much as we are struggling to see them. All right, buckle up. We've got a bunch of questions related to the video last time. Again, this argument conversation about the Fermi paradox and the great filter just unfolds forever. So, um, you know, we'll just keep going in circles, uh, which is fun. I really enjoy it. So. Uh, you're absolutely right that 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 to say that you know my gut instinct is that we are alone is not a very accurate way, and it's not it's not the right way to to say it. the 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 best answer is that I have no idea. Right? There is insufficient evidence so far to come to a conclusion one way or the other. The universe is big, the universe is old, life is everywhere here on Earth, it makes sense that there could be life everywhere in the universe, and yet we see no evidence of it, therefore the answer is, I don't know, we haven't checked very much. And, and you know, if you ask, like, give me your absolute solid answer, what do you think? My answer is, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Let's find out. Right? Bill Cape. Lack of evidence is not evidence of non-existence. However, your position seems to be more agnostic regarding ET life. I really can't fault you for believing this way. However, consider this. We've only been listening for alien signals for a few years. If you take a map of the Milky Way and draw a circle around Sol, that represents 200 light years. You can see that area in which signals may be present is ridiculously small. So the thing that's really important to understand in this conversation is that it is not about receiving signals, right? Obviously, the Milky Way is gigantic gigantic the amount of the signals that we could receive is a tiny amount uh, Jason Wright who did a guest answer last episode he had done a calculation that essentially if you compare the entire ocean of the earth the amount that we've searched is a hot tub and it's so it's like dipping into a hot tub and saying looking in and going I don't see any fish therefore there are no fish in the ocean when you haven't explored the entire ocean that's ridiculous I get that absolutely no question. The, what the Fermi paradox hinges on is this idea that intelligent civilizations will attempt to cross the gulfs to other stars. That there is no reason in the laws of physics that would prevent uh, an, a highly advanced civilization from being able to go from star to star. And so then, it doesn't matter how far away they are and where they started, they will eventually make their way to you. And so we've done whole episodes about this, but essentially this, this calculation of, of how long would it take to settle the entire Milky Way. And so even if you're only going 10% the speed of light, you would send a spacecraft to one world and that spacecraft would make a million copies of itself and then they would go to all these other worlds and then they would make millions of copies of themselves and they go to other worlds, right? And then you would, over the course of about 10 million years, going only 10% the speed of light, you would settle every single star system in the entire Milky Way. 200 billion stars, you would settle them all because you'd use local resources to make more and, and go on and so forth, right? And again, it's like saying, you know, we look at the oceans, right? And yet you can dip a cup into any part of the ocean and you will find life inside of it. And so it's not like, the point is that the life made its way to every corner of the ocean. And so that's the part that is so kind of mind blowing about the Fermi paradox is you have to make that assumption that that advanced civilizations are going to be able to travel from world to world. And then you can say to yourself, okay, um, uh, maybe it's too hard, maybe it's too far, maybe it's not possible, blah, 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 right? But then that means that we will never be able to do it either. That it, is, that it is against the laws of physics entirely for us to be able to travel from, world, from star to star. Uh, there's something limiting it, something that stops it. 
and yet we see rocks like Oumuamua or Comet uh, 2i Borisov, which have made the journey from star system to star system. So if a rock can do it, then it doesn't seem completely outlandish that we in a thousand years, 10,000 years, 100,000 years could develop a technology capable of going from star to star. So the it is not about the search out there, it is about wondering why they haven't come here. And that is the heart of the Fermi Paradox. And every year that goes by that we develop more advanced technology, as we get better and better at spaceflight, the weirder it seems that that we haven't seen any evidence of them coming to us. Carrie Ann Halson. I hate when people say universe, especially when talking about being alone. Alone in the Milky Way? Possibly. But there are trillions of galaxies. No way that we're alone in the universe, and there's no way for us to ever know as the distance is just too far. Stop worrying about the universe and just bring it down to our local area in this small portion of the Milky Way and not the whole Milky Way either. Too big, too big. You can't constrain my imagination, man. I can think about the whole universe, and it's fun to do so. Um, obviously, the Milky Way, you know, back to that idea, right, that we can barely scan the signals from a, just a sphere around the Earth. It's just a couple of hundred light years, maybe with new technology, bigger radio dishes. We can go thousands of light years, uh, but that's you know, it's really a practical limit to how far we can we can scan, and we would be looking for signals that are directed right at us. But one of the you know, when you use your imagination, you think like, what are all the different ways that an intelligent civilization could give off? some kind of techno signature of its existence and you could think about some of these some of the really extreme ideas like what if you've got an alien civilization that has is using up all of the energy that's coming from their star and then all of that that light they're gathering all the visible light and then they're using it for all kinds of things machines computers whatever and then that light is giving off radiation into space in the form of infrared in the form of heat because if you don't let out that heat then you cook so you gotta get rid of the heat and so you can and this you, know, you can imagine looking into the sky and looking for stars which are only in the infrared, but they're giving off like a tremendous amount of infrared in a very specific wavelength. It would be an indication of a technological civilization. And then take that one level farther. Imagine some super advanced civilization that has, that has, you know, has done this process, but with all of the stars in their entire galaxy, you would be seeing a galaxy that is shining in the infrared in a very specific, very detectable way. And this has been searched for. Astronomers have actually done surveys looking through all of the galaxies in, say, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, looking for weird anomalies, weird galaxies that are shining only in the infrared, but not in the visible light. And the best thing that you could hope to find would be to see a galaxy that is partly settled. So it might be, say, the left-hand side of the galaxy is covered in is only shining in infrared while the right side of the galaxy is shining in visible light. And so the point of this idea is just we don't want to constrain our imagination, right? Because because imagination is free. It's easy. You just think things. And you know, no no spacecraft were built, no radio dishes were developed, no no nails were hammered. You just thought and you used your creativity and your imagination to think about ways that you might be able to search for life. And there are these wonderful uh, research papers about searching for techno signatures where people think about all of the things that we do that leak radiation, that provide some kind of evidence that we are here, and then you use that as a starting point, as an idea for searching out in the universe. And it might very well be that in a hundred years, we develop some new kind of quantum computer that gives off a very specific flash every time you turn it on, and suddenly people go, "Oh, there's a new techno signature. Let's scan the skies for these flashes of neutrinos when we turn on our quantum computers, or whatever it is." Right? Everything that we do, every technology that we do, gives us ideas for how to search out in the universe. So, I refuse to constrain myself to anything but the entire universe. Neva Zero. I have a question. Are most humans strategically inept and short-sighted? No. Most humans, like the 99.9999% are great. I like humans. They're like my favorite kind of sentient beings that I know of.
Um, uh, but the thing that we all fall into is this idea of cognitive biases, where we evolved here on Earth and we evolved to prioritize certain things, things that are sooner as opposed to things that take longer. So short-term outcomes versus long-term issues that might affect us. Um, we uh, just in the choices in the day to day life in the way just our brains are arranged, then you don't even kind of realize um, there's some great websites out there that list and I highly recommend you do go do a Google search for cognitive biases and then see all the all the examples of the biases that are out there and how we can fall into them. And hopefully you can see these happening in your own life and try to route around them. Although even like psychologists who behavioral psychologists who write these books and understand these cognitive biases still fall into these cognitive biases. So they're really hard to avoid. But I think that a lot of the things that you would call people being inept or dumb or uh, stupid or whatever is people falling into these cognitive biases that it takes real active self honesty and knowledge to be able to avoid them. And most people can't avoid them most of the time. Uh, but it's great that at least we know they exist. So you can try to spot them in your own life. Lou Lau. Hey Fraser, love your videos. I've got a question for you. Could the star Betelgeuse have had an event a few weeks ago? The gravity waves we detected could have been a sign of an epic explosion, destroying a planet or another large object. Now we see that matter blocking the starlight. This being the cause of a new shape of the star. What do you think? There was a report of a burst of gravitational waves coming from some event in the region of Betelgeuse. You know, the current gravitational wave observatories aren't super accurate, uh, so it was, but it was within a couple of degrees, which is kind of a big coincidence considering everything that's going on with Betelgeuse. But it almost certainly has absolutely nothing to do with Betelgeuse, and the fact that Betelgeuse is still there, right? When the supernovas happen, they happen like materials falling into the star at like 70% the speed of light. So when it happens, it happens fast. So almost certainly at this point, it's some other event that happened to be in that rough kind of region of the sky, but, but millions of light years away, much farther than, than 650 light years. That said, if Betelgeuse did go off and it was that close, uh, you know, there are some models that would show that maybe we could detect some amount of gravitational waves from that region, especially if there was some, you know, if, if the explosion happens in a way that's kind of off axis and it, you know, kicks itself sideways a little bit and generates a bunch of gravitational waves. The other thing, of course, that we would see, hopefully, is a blast of neutrinos coming from the event because the neutrinos are, are generated inside the core. In fact, 99% of the energy released in a supernova come from the neutrinos themselves. And there is a, there's an early warning system here on Earth that's waiting to detect a blast of neutrinos to let astronomers know that a supernova has gone off relatively nearby for them to scan the skies, trying to catch it as quickly as possible. And so far, this alert hasn't been used. It hasn't gone off. No supernova has been close enough to trigger it. But if one went off as close as Betelgeuse, then you would have this great cascade of, of neutrinos. Astronomers would know that a supernova ha was happening somewhere. They would be able to turn their telescopes and watch it unfold as the explosion happened. So um, we did a video about the future gravitational wave observatories and that kind of predictive power in the future could be in our grasp. So, uh, you know, it's going to be really exciting to see what happens with gravitational wave observatories over time. Stefan Buller. I could see archive coming a mile away. It's without question the definitive source for physics papers. It's probably worth pointing out that the papers you find there are not yet peer reviewed and you're responsible to vet papers for yourself. Yeah, great point, uh, which I should have mentioned last week about archive.org, which is that the papers that are published on archive are, are have not been peer reviewed and then accepted for publication in some journal. It's sort of like a, a researcher will do their work, they'll publish it on archive, other researchers will take a look at it, and then, uh, but they will also submit that paper to various journals for publication, and then it can be peer reviewed, and then a modified version will end up in the paper, like the journal Nature or 
the Journal of Astrophysics or, or things like that. That said, the quality of the papers is, is very good. Um, you know, as a non astrophysicist, but you know, the number of times that I have watched us go from paper to journal, paper to journal uh, is, you, know, you can see that the quality is, is, is very high, but you do have to be careful for sure. Um, but the, but the people who are publishing into archive are generally astrophysicists or people working at NASA or people working at the European Space Agency, etc. right? Big, especially like big collaborations, you'll see stuff pop up there first and then make its way out to some scientific journal. And so it's a way to get a bit of an advance notice on the news that is starting to break. That said, if a piece of news is really big, then usually the researchers will hang on to it and they'll go straight to a journal and they'll publish it that way, say through the journal Nature. And so there's no advance notice. It just shows up on the journal and then we all find out about it simultaneously. So, but I still like Astro uh, PH Archive, uh, you know, archive.org, the Astro PH section. I read it every day looking for interesting stories and there's really fascinating ideas in there and also just historical ideas. So, uh, but yeah, be careful when you're looking on there. It hasn't been peer reviewed yet. Just in case. Okay, here it comes. If we are alone in the universe, if we are it, we are incredibly special. Every life, every creature is special. And even today, with the question unknown that we are deaf to that understanding, we lack our place in the universe. We war against ourselves. We are driven self-promoters. We are acting as infants. If we find life, how exciting. If we don't find life, how enormously important is it to know our place in the cosmos? So I replied to you in the comments and the gist of my comment was this a thousand times this. That, that this is one of the, this is like the heart of how I feel about this whole process is that, yeah, if we look out into the universe and we find evidence of some other alien life, and if we find evidence of some alien civilization, then we know that, that there is life, that there is intelligent life in this, in this entire universe, right? And that, and that the pressure is off us to not completely mess this up. Um, but what if we're alone? What if we are alone, right? That the universe is gigantic, that it is hundreds uh, you know, of billions of light years across, that it is ancient, that there are trillions of galaxies just in the observable universe, that there are, um, each galaxy has hundreds of billions of stars. It is a gigantic place. And yet if it is all alone, if it is just rocks and stars and, and various molecules and water and ice and nothing alive, um, I think it was in Carl Sagan, right? That if, it, if we are alone, that it's an awful waste of space. Then imagine that whole universe, this wonderful thing, this life, that intelligent life comes to being in this universe. And then because we couldn't get our act together, we messed it up and and then we went extinct, and then the, the dolphins didn't figure it out, and then the octopuses didn't figure it out, and then the sun expands and bakes all life on Earth, and then life is gone again from the universe. What a, what a shame. What a tragedy. So, so I feel like we have this, this responsibility. You know, step one figure out if we're alone in the universe. Step two, ensure that life gets to exist in the universe. Because if we don't, then, then, then the universe will have lost an opportunity to have something wonderful, right? Which is life, which is the way the universe can perceive itself. And the universe is going to go on for billions and trillions and quadrillions of years. And yet it would be empty and just be rocks and dirt and ice and whatever bumping into each other and not all of the kind of wonder and, and uh, incredible nature and, and, and all the kind of diversity of life forms and, and intelligence and conversations and, and philosophy and all this wonderful stuff that makes life worth living. It would suck if that didn't get a chance to be in the universe. And so uh, definitely one of the kind of drivers for me about this question is just like, is it up to us? Let's assume that it is up to us. 
until we find some evidence that it's not up to us. And if it's not up to us, then we'll let the aliens, we'll let the, we'll let the, you know, the aliens on Proxima Centauri uh, deal with the big philosophical questions. But if it is up to us, let's not mess this up. Let's not mess up our planet. Let's not have wars. Let's try to work together to give life a toehold in this incredible universe. Masi12312. Hey Fraser, greetings from Germany. Is the expansion of the universe a stronger force than the gravitational pull of galaxies or even superclusters? So will the gravitational collapse still happen when the expansion has proceeded further? This was a big question uh, over the last couple of decades, right? Which is that is the universe going to continue expanding um, and forever? just getting less and less dense over time? Or will there be, you know, the mutual gravitational attraction of all of the galaxies in the universe? Will it eventually, like a rubber band, right, slow down, and then all the gravity will pull it back together. And then you'll get this, you know, the Big Bang will essentially go in reverse and all the galaxies, the space will get less dense, the galaxies will get closer together. And eventually, it'll all mash back together into this super hot, you know, quark gluon plasma, and then maybe it'll explode again as another Big Bang, right? Um, and then that was all thrown into um, sort of chaos with the discovery of dark energy, that not only is the universe expanding, and they thought it was sort of coasting to some kind of a stop, but in fact, it looks like the expansion of the universe is accelerating. And so all the galaxies are moving farther and farther apart, and, and that expansion rate is accelerating, picking up over time. Um, and the, the analogy that you always like to use is like, you know, imagine you throw a ball up into the air and the ball goes up and then it comes back down into your hand. And that's the way astronomers used to think about the expansion of the universe. And the weird thing about dark energy is you throw the ball up and the ball accelerates away off into space. Super weird, not expected. Um, has deep implications for what the future holds of our universe. And so obviously, this is a big question. And many researchers are trying to get to the bottom of this. So right now, uh, you know, it's almost certainly not going to come back together. And now it's just a question is like, what impact is dark energy going to have on the future evolution of the universe? Kumar Sivathamparam. How big of a telescope should we build to see the actual landscape of an exoplanet? For example, the planet that is orbiting Proxima Centauri. Will James Webb be able to detect any signs of biochemistry? Great question. And once again, I brought in a ringer. This time it's Dr. Jesse Christensen, who is an exoplanetary scientist uh, at the American Astronomical Society. I've done whole open space live streams with uh, Dr. Christensen, which you should definitely check out. Very interesting. Uh, and she tackled your answer. So the biggest telescope that NASA is thinking about right now is called Louvois-A and it's 16 meters. With Louvois-A, we expect to be able to just resolve a dot that is a planet, the disk of the planet. So if we want to see features on the surface of that planet, like continents or oceans, we're going to need something even bigger, even beyond the next few decades of what we're studying. So if you wanted to see a continent that was, say, a third the, top the size of that dot, you'd need to make your telescope at least three times bigger. And that's a really exciting place to be, because now we're talking about assembly in space. You're going to have to launch that in separate bits and put it together. So that's really exciting. But that's what we're talking about in order to resolve features on the surface of a planet. All right, thanks, Jesse. That was awesome. As always, uh, we've reached the end of our question show. Uh, so once again, uh, thank you everyone who sent in the questions. This is super fun. Uh, if a question pops in your brain, write it down, gather them up. I'll answer them here, and I'll see you next week.